It's been about two years since we drove the Mustang Mach-E. So in this video, we're gonna talk about some of its growing pains, what it is and what it isn't. And of course, why there's been a reduced demand for electric cars like this recently, enough so that many manufacturers and investors are quite worried about it. We're gonna go in the shop, we're gonna take this for a quick drive and then a summary, so let's get started. Now there have been some subtle tweaks to the Mach-E since it was released. So what you're doing is you're taking the front end off of some of their existing SUVs and utilizing it here for an electric architecture. So the center plane of this car is a battery pack. You've added options for an electric motor in the rear and all wheel drive. You have the standard range model and you have the extended range model. Now they use two separate types of battery chemistry for the long range versus the short range. The short range battery pack has now had its chemistry changed to LFP, which is a lithium phosphate battery. It is devoid of nickel and cobalt. There's some distinct advantages and disadvantages, which I'll cover in a minute. This is still made by CATL. It is a Chinese battery pack and Ford had initially invested or allocated billions of dollars to build their battery plant in the United States so they could be built here, take advantage of tax credits, blah, blah, blah. That's not happening now. They're kicking that down the road because, well, people are not buying electric cars like they anticipated. Uh, the Mach-E from its first year to its second year now is dropped about 21% in sales. And you could look at other models too, and there's a drop across the board. Not gonna get into that right now, but the point is, is Ford was looking at how to cut cost, and that's why they've changed to this battery chemistry, which to be fair, other brands have done like Tesla to lower the cost of their entry level products. Now, the benefit of the LFP is, again, it's more really there for fleet customers because when you don't have the nickel and the cobalt, one of the things that it does allow you to do is charge to 100% more frequently without battery degradation. Whereas the lithium ion counterparts, they're more sensitive to that, so you typically wanna charge it to 80%. So what this does is, Battery longevity is better for your fleet customers. You don't have to worry about it. But what it does is it's slower and it's not capable of putting out the ultimate power, which in the lower battery pack size, I don't think they think customers can care about that as much. But again, it's more for their fleet customers versus the performance customers. Now, there have been some problems with their long range version only, and that's typically reserved for higher output. Uh, the GT models, the all wheel drive models, which is the one that we have here. and Initially, they had problems with the contactors, which is on a control board inside the battery pack. And these contactors, what they really are is there to disengage and engage the inverter or the electric motors to the battery. So it's, it does a whole bunch of pre-checks and it looks at, okay, is X, Y, and Z working? So it goes in an order of connecting the contactors for the positive and negative terminals. And Weber Automotive, Kelly, who's the, the professor there, teacher, uh, they do an amazing job at tearing down a lot of modern equipment. And we've, we've looked at this in the past and we've showed footage. And if you're a technician or somebody that wants to learn about the engineering and how to take things apart, uh, they do some of the best job, or he does some of the best job on the internet of showing how these parts work and showing how to repair them. So over this, I'm gonna talk a little bit through that. So these contactors, what happens is, since Ford spec'd out what is apparently the same part on the lower battery pack versus the extended range, they didn't really figure out the fact that there was gonna be more heat generated through DC fast charging on a larger battery pack and more heat generated from the current that is going through these contactors from extended or harder core driving on the GT models. So as it generates more heat, it shorts out the circuit board or generates enough heat in the contactors where they weld open or closed. So what happens is if it welds closed when you're driving, the car's gonna drive fine, but when you shut off the car and restart it, if those contactors are in a closed state, uh, well, all these pre-checks look at, okay, there's a problem and it will not start and it bricks and you have to take it to a dealership. They have to put it on a lift. They have to literally lower down the battery pack take the battery pack down, take the control board out, swap it, and then reseal the battery. And, and there's a whole procedure of doing all this. It's a massive amount of work. So Ford tried to fix it for, through a recall through software, which meant <laughs> changing the amount of voltage during fast charging, DC fast charging, monitoring that and lowering the speed to reduce heat, and then reducing heat generated by 
this, your right foot, so they would reduce power, cut power, so the thermal load wasn't on the, the contactors, essentially. So that didn't work for all the cars, probably because they already created the problem, and after the software update, these cars were mechanically damaged already. So now they're doing a full-blown recall of essentially like 30,000 cars that have to come into the dealership to have this control unit replaced that's inside the battery pack. And if, you know, to me, this is worst case scenario for a car like this, because one, you're trying to, you know, make your electric car, this like flagship Mustang thing. And now you're having, you know, dealers that probably don't have a lot of experience with this, having to do this massive amount of work. It's essentially worse than engine out really. And then you're worried about, are they going to put it back together? Right. Are they going to torque the parts? Right. Are they going to keep clean hands and all the contactors and all the electrical parts inside this anyway? So that's what you're going through on a first generation Mustang. The, the philosophy, the other philosophy here is this is an interesting car because clearly Ford executives inside Ford made a decision based on, it was an emergency to make an electric car now. And there was a clear division and I think you see it in the marketing. You see, I've heard it talking to people inside Ford. There was a clear division on, they weren't unified in making a Mustang EV. It was a marketing exercise. It was a response to the market. We need one now, or we're going to fall behind. Whatever the pressures were, having a, a brand with engineers and the people behind it that didn't particularly want to do a Mustang EV, let alone a crossover or an SUV version, you can see it all over this thing. This reactive mindset of building a car not out of passion, but because they didn't want to be late to the game or they didn't want to be, you know, sitting on the sidelines while Tesla took over. It's, it wasn't smart. And clearly in retrospect, you're going to see more and more of that. And the first generation of these products are going to suffer. The customers are going to suffer when they're stuck with some of these chicken shit problems that should have been sorted out. But again, as a customer, I think people are getting smart. They don't want to spend 50 plus thousand dollars on an experiment. And if you're one of those people, uh, that has, I would be shocked to my core if anybody walked away from selling a Mustang Mach-E and said, oh boy, I, I'm going to miss that car. I'm always going to think about it. This, this thing was amazing. And I don't think it's one of those cars that's going to do that. And with that name on it, that brand legacy, it's a big mistake doing that and not having people walk away feeling like it's a special vehicle. But Jack and I are going to take this for a quick drive and talk through some of the pros and cons of the car. <laughs> what I will say is it's kind of an accelerating drive machine and road align as one. There's definitely more responsive acceleration and steering in this mode, Jack. I, I, I don't disagree with you, Mark. And when I put it in engage mode, Mark... Well, it's more of a balanced drive for everyday fun. And then into whisper? Well, it's more of a seamless drive. Calm, quiet, smoother acceleration and steering. The best mode for slippery conditions. I don't disagree, Mark. And whenever I'm in this car, it's clearly slippery conditions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, let's talk about... Nobody cares about this car. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe the owners, and they're worried about what's going to happen with it, and if is the resale value going to be obliterated as yes. more discounts get yeah. added. Okay. Yes. So now you can buy this. You Despite can buy early ones for like in the high twenties, low thirties. No, really that low? Why? Would, why, Jack? This, there's nothing wrong with there's this. There's no problems with this vehicle. It's perfect in every way. It's a Mustang. Okay, so let's let's just be more constructive, right? Like, I don't blame why people wanted to be on the bandwagon of an early release of this. But when you really, really get down to it, from the screen in here, the, the tech, the, the drivability, there's not like there's anything really wrong with it. It's a very average car. So, so why would you buy this, at least in North America, or I'm sorry, the United States? Our argument in the shop off camera was, there is no compelling reason why to spend more money than an internal combustion counterpart in the SUV space. This does really at this price point. At this price point, and their marketing. Let me tell you what their marketing says: the GT is faster than a Macan Turbo S, and it's faster than certain 911 iterations in a straight line. So, if you're not buying into the marketing bullshit of this Mustang thing and the speed and all that, which all electric cars are quick in a straight line, what does this do that the others don't do? That you would spend more money on it for? If this was a thirty thousand dollar car, right, and and 
it offered this level of experience at 30 grand and you were cross shopping this with a Bronco Sport or an Escape, you have a very strong argument for why you would buy an EV vehicle. The problem is when you are playing in the premium category, most of those cars have premium drivetrains. Yeah. And the benefit and the refinement of the EV element of the drivetrains is not super substantial, at least to me at this price point. And it's hard to make a strong argument for really this car at all. And in the truck space where you were bringing the Lightning does not sell particularly well, and the Lightning is not a Rivian, right? The people buying right. F-150s are buying them for traditional truck purposes, where the Rivian and soon to be the Cybertruck are lifestyle vehicles basically entirely. Right. That is not a better truck than a traditional F-150. The roundabout way, I know what you're getting at, and I think to, to answer the original question is the brands are trying to figure out why there's not interest in these EVs that are overpriced. And the, what you just said is you have 70,000 different trims of the F-150. And the Lightning, aside from having an electric propulsion, doesn't do anything particularly better than the regular F-150. It can't tow as much. It's not going to be as off-road capable in many conditions, and it's not functionally as good every single day because you have range anxiety of it in a, a world where we're at where you don't have the charging network. So to be honest, you're going to choose a regular F-150 you know you can use every day and you never have to think about the battery part of it. And I don't think everybody cares about battery propulsion. It's not the end of the world. So this is the same problem with this. Unless in a you're premium SUV. In a premium SUV. Unless you're making it with better range than the, the gasoline counterparts, you're making it more convenient to charge all over the place, and you're making it significantly cheaper or better than the internal combustion counterparts, there's no point of choosing this because our ICE era cars, they're still better options. Yeah, and again, if this car was, you know, like a Bronco Sport price and that, you know, high 20s, mid 30s price range, I could forgive a lot of this. I could even forgive all the recalls. I think that's the other element of this. I have to imagine buyer confidence has been sapped in this car, particularly in a lot of these first gen cars, you'd all the teething pains. Yeah, and I think some of this, this screen, like the propulsion sounds, all the shit that they're trying to make it differentiate, a lot of it is gimmicks that people just don't care about and they're certainly not going to pay more money for Outside them. of the areas where you're subsidized to do it, yeah. or you're forced to do it, right? it's a very hard ask to get someone out of something like a Q5 or an X3 versus this thing. Oh, absolutely. In the, in the United States, you're not going to be forced to do it. There's a huge divide, and I saw an article, I think it was from Edmonds, where um, she was saying that the divide in America is a lot of states view electric cars like they view forced immunization. You know, like, you're not going to force an electric car on me. Like, you, it's become a political issue, and it's not a political issue for us. It's just about, like, I don't want people spending their money on a, a car that's totally disposable. That's more what it is. Prove to me that it's nothing more than a first-generation car, that it has staying power. I would invest or in Or offer it. something over its internal combustion yes, counterpart. Agreed. So, Mark, with that, let's head into the end of this video, sir. All right. Final thoughts on the Mustang Mach-E. And clearly, anything you want to know about this car, more so, we did in our original video. But it's a philosophy. It's talking about some of the issues with first-generation electric cars. And I know we beat that topic to death. There's only so many times you can say, well you know, wait till the next generation. I mean, people understand that with electronics and phones and all that, they're, they're, the next thing's probably gonna be better, and this is a perfect example. And not that there's anything particularly wrong with the Mach-E, take away the branding and the marketing and all of that. It's a pretty noble first try. You can tell the people behind the car put a lot of effort into it to make it the best thing they could possibly put out in the market given the constraints of a corporate culture that is obsessed with copying and pasting what everybody else is doing. It's not enough, and you see it more so when you look at the technology in cars like this. It's technology there for the sake of it. This is an electric car for the sake of it, not because you're breaking any new ground. It literally was just there to say, oh, we have to have an electric car. And, you know, we're gonna figure out how to manipulate it where people are gonna buy it. And again, that's not enough. And it's not enough when the prices of everything are at a, a stratospheric level where people can't afford it. Normal people can't afford it. And Ford basically right now is stuck in the one car game and then the trucks are keeping them afloat. 
So it, again, it's about company direction. It's about corporate culture. There's a lot of factors, but at the end of the day, you're making cars for customers and everybody's gonna be like, we follow the customers. Now, there's a lot of other people doing the same thing. And I think there's definitely needs to be a rethink of this entire structure and industry. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.